Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Cascadia Rolling Hills. But before I get to that, please remember this was a sponsored preview. And with that out of the way, folks, it's Cascadia. It's a roll and write. Those are two great tastes that taste great together. Although, one thing you have to know going in, this, other than its setting and use of the same types of environments and same types of the five uh, um, you know, creatures of the, of the woods, um, this feels nothing like Cascadia. This is a wholly new beast. Uh, there's none of the entwined pairs drafting that made Cascadia, you know, such a monster hit. It was just so well designed, and you know, I'll say what won the Spiel des Jahres, I think, and, and with good reason. It was such a, a a phenomenal title. So, you know, a roll and write version of it. You know, the Rolling Hills, which I just demonstrated for you, or its sister product, Rolling Rivers, right there. Which, by the way, if you'd like to hear more about that. Links are down in the show notes, folks, so you can go watch Amy and Maggie play the other version. Although, the reality is, which one do you get? Well, you kind of either don't want to get either of them, you want to get both, because they're the exact same game. The difference between these two is they come with different special powers on the special action die, um, and they come with different uh, unique environments that you can play through, different puzzles to try to solve, and different special powers that you can use along the way. And um, honestly, if you love one, you are going to love the other, and you will want to have both of them so you can mix and match the uh, different special powers dice with the different environments and all of that. And um, yeah, I, I could certainly see why I would like it as a diehard Cascadia fan. This is a blast also, even if it is such a radically big change. I didn't expect it to be such a huge departure. So really, you have to judge it on its own merits because, I mean, heck, if they hadn't used Cascadia-style iconography and named it that, I don't even think I would have drawn a comparison between it and the original Cascadia. It's so different. So, well, what makes this game special? What makes it stand out from the 50 billion other rolling rights out there? I got two words for you folks. Conveyor belts. Oh my gosh, I love conveyor belts. And I remember talking about this years ago. It must have been three or four years ago. There was like a, a, a grouping of like three or four games that featured conveyor belts um, you know, in them that I played over the space of like three or four months. And I remember I declared on one of them, maybe it was Mechanica or something like that, that I love conveyor belts. Chocolate Factory, there were so many of them. And they are so satisfying because of the way they make events work. Event decks, which you know is, is the beating heart of this game. Hey, I've got this deck. It's going to be a whole bunch of recipes that I can fulfill. And you know, in any other game, they would just say, hey, yeah, let's just bring one out and you've got, oh, that's what you're trying to do this turn. And and next turn, oh, you're trying to do another one. Or, hey, you know what? We just have three on display, and as soon as somebody finishes one, then a new one comes out. That's the way most games do this. And there's nothing wrong with that? Or at least, I didn't ever think there was anything wrong with that until I played this game. Because this conveyor belt, where, you know what? I've only got four rounds to get this thing. Because at the end of every round, they are going to slide over. I'm going to say goodbye to ones, and new ones come out. And now, I've only got four rounds to deal with this one. And the thing is, I can do this one multiple times. And depending on whether I do it now or now, or now, I'll get different payouts, or I'll get different discounts off of it. You know, the fact that there is this conveyor belt that um, makes the, that gives us multiple opportunities and a limited window to score these things based on how we harvest resources, i.e. creatures from the dice, is just brilliant. And I love it to pieces. It is so sharp. It is so much fun. It is so much more satisfying than the way these normal harvest resources and fulfill recipes games work. The, the, uh, the conveyor belt elevates it to another level way above everybody else out there. And so, in the same way, the Cascadia is probably one of the most monumental, influential, and impactful tile layers of the last few years. Is this is this going to do the same thing for Roland Rights? I don't know about Roland Rights specifically, but I hope other developers take a look at this, and is there planning on doing it? Yet another game where, oh, there's a collection of recipes I can fulfill, and when one is, and everybody's racing to do them, uh, maybe they should stop and think, maybe I should invest in conveyor belts. Because conveyor belts are maybe becoming one of my favorite board game mechanisms, and they're almost never used. They're just so smart. They give you so much control. I mean, they're the antithesis of one of the things I hate most in board gaming. Nasty, out-of-the-blue event cards. That, hey, you had no idea this thing was coming, and oh, it's great for your opponent, and it's terrible for you, and that's just dumb luck, and it's garbage design every time a game does it. I'm 
always appreciate event-based games where, oh, look, I can see the events that are coming, like Orléans, and I can prepare for them. This game says, hey, you can you have a lot of time to prepare for that recipe. No one's going to take it from you. Only the passage of time will. And maybe you do it now, or maybe you wait and complete that recipe next round when it slots in to the next spot, because that'll give you a better payday. That is so cool. That, um, you know, this game could have just been very bog standard, very like, yeah, it's nice. Oh, I appreciate the variety. There's all these different, um, you know, ways you can, you know, uh, harvest your, you know, use your resources to complete different objectives. And, oh, there's a nice variety of bonuses you get. That would have been enough. But this conveyor belt, folks, I cannot stress enough just how phenomenal it is. It's maybe hard to get a sense for it until you play it yourself, but it really um, is next-gen stuff. And I gotta doff my cap to the gang at Flat Out Games for coming up with it. Now, all that said, it's not perfect. Um, I you know, Certainly one thing that is very weird, the way we actually keep track of, like, you know, here's, here's a game we finished where it's just like, you know, I don't know if you can actually see it, I'm probably too bright in here, but you know, just crossing out what we've done and writing new numbers, it's fine. It's not hard. It doesn't get in your way, but you're constantly, right, okay, I got four. I already had one. That's five. It's easy math. Or, okay, I had three. I spent two, so I'm now down to one. But it is kind of fiddly. And actually, it's interesting. If you go and watch Amy and Maggie's run through, throughout the video, they were constantly, wait, did I, did I get the one? Did I get the two? Now, it's because they weren't writing zeros in. Pro tip, they should literally say this in the rule book. When you use up all your things, put the zero in. Because if you don't, it becomes very easy to forget. Right, did I already do this? Did I forget to write something? Anyway, though, um, I just don't understand why they went with this. Because if there's one thing that we have clearly established is the correct way to keep track of resources in a roll and write is to have a big grid of a bunch of circles. And when you get a thing, you circle it. And then once you use it, you cross it out. So you can add a glance see, oh, I've got a bunch of this thing, or I don't have a lot of that thing. That would have made this a lot easier to read. Because I'm going to write, okay, how many do I have? I've got three bears, one elk, no fox. And you know, it would be so much nicer just to look at this, see a grid of dots, some of which are circled, some of which are X'd out. And I would just add a glance, be able to instantly see. I think maybe this would have to get a little bit bigger because you'd probably have to have multiple rows. But heck, I mean, Jen and I played where you know we actually fill these lines up and we have to flip over to the other side anyway and keep filling anyway. Um, so, I, it's a minor thing. They went a different way. I, I'd appreciate them going a different way if it was better. But I think the established way of keeping track of lots of resources that most games do uh, is probably the better way to go. Minor complaint, though. I'm not really bothered about that. I, there was one other thing, though, that Jen and I found. We've played now through a few of the uh, different maps in both of the versions. And in most of the games we've played, we've had this feeling that 20 rounds is a little long. Um, because by the end of the game, you will have done most everything you want to do. You will have completed a lot of stuff. And we both said, you know what? It feels like about the time we get to about two-thirds of the game, the game should be peaking. We should be reaching our crescendo right now. And we should be desperately trying to get that last roll, to get that last bear, to get that one last thing. But we usually get to, like, turn 16 or turn 17, and we're like, oh my gosh, are there like three or four more turns to go? I feel like I've done just about everything there is to do. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I'm sure for some people they love that because it's very, very satisfying. But for me and Jen, honestly, I wouldn't mind. I love how in the uh, the Landmarks expansion for Cascadia, they came up with an express way to play that really speeds the game up. I wouldn't mind an express version, a variant for the rules here. The way it works is uh, you, you have a certain number of level 1 and level 2 cards. And as part of setup, you would randomly take out um, 5 level 1s and 5 level 2s, right? One of each type. And so that you've got your 20. I wouldn't mind an express version where, hey, let's take out 5 level 1s and 10 level 2s. So the game is only 15 rounds instead of 20. So that by the time we're getting to the end, we're desperate. We're, you know, we're still just, we're right at that moment where, oh, if I could just get a little bit more time, if I can just figure out this puzzle, I can make it happen. As opposed to, oh, no, I'm going to make it happen. And now I'm trying to figure out, geez, what else am I going to do for these last couple of turns? Because I feel like I've done most everything. Now that's not true. There's always more you can do, including just harvesting stuff. But there have been times where like, you know what? I'm just going to harvest some animals. Um, because they're worth a fifth of a point at the end. And that's kind of a little anticlimactic. It feels like the game just goes a few more rounds longer than need to be. Now, 
folks, uh, don't take my word for it. Go watch Amy and Maggie. Go watch other people. There's a lot of folks covering this. Um, you know, ask the publishers if you know they're play testers. Maybe it's just me and Jen who felt this way. Um, I'm actually I'm actually planning on playing this with Dan King and some of his friends because we're here in Phoenix, Arizona. He's the Game Boy geek, and I know he's excited to play this too. So we'll see if. I mean, I was gonna say maybe it's a two-player thing, but it's not. That's another weird thing about this game. This is 100% multiplayer solitaire. And actually, the solo game is a little disappointing. The solo game rules are just play normally and try to beat your last score. And that's it. That's not great. Now, to be fair, they do actually have this big, like, multiple sheets of achievements you can try to do. So you could play through a series of levels and try to complete different achievements in the solo. That's better. But I really kind of felt like, at the very least, the game should come with a you know, a, a score sheet to say, well, hey, if you want to consider you're having done well, you should have scored at least 50 points or, you know, with this combination or on this particular board or, or, or something like that, something like that uh, for the solo mode uh, rather than just saying, oh, just beat your previous score or, you know, tick off a bunch of achievements, which a lot of them are really not particularly exciting. So the solo mode, just just a little something. Just, you know, just, I mean, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm not looking for, um, you know, reinventing the wheel because, you know, there's no reason to have an automa because whether I'm playing with you or by myself or with eight people, because if you get both of these, you can play eight players, folks, um, you know, and have a huge game of this and be very satisfying and everybody going at the same time. But it is a game where everybody's head down, focusing on their own thing. And that's one other thing I should mention. This game, like Cascadia before it, uh, maybe even more, even more than Cascadia before it, can get super crunchy. And as the game goes on and you start unlocking multiple bonuses, like there was one round in one game we played where, hey, because of the stuff I did and I did that and that let me circle that thing, which means I got that bonus and that bonus let me do that thing. And then at the end of all of it, after I, you know, I, I ended up saying, hey, I could mark any two, let's see, it was on, I think it was on this map. I could mark any two of these, plus I can give myself one animal and I could do it in any order I want. And, oh my god, that made... I mean, this is something I'm used to seeing from Jen, where sometimes she'll take three, four, five, six minutes to puzzle out how to do it. I, I very rarely allow myself the luxury of doing it, but I felt like I had to because there were just so many options. Bearing in mind what cards were still available, what animals I should get, what I was trying to finish for different areas, and, and that was a huge turn. I had to keep apologizing. I'm so sorry. And at the end of it, I think it took me three or four minutes, and that was... That is not the way I play games normally, folks, and you got to know that going in. This game gets crunchy. And by default, there is zero player interaction. Everybody is playing a solo game just trying to beat each other's scores. Now, there's no problem with that for me. I think that's totally fine. I am a, a board game geek micro badge holder that says fan of multiplayer solitaire. Love it. But I should point out, in case you looked at this and you said, well, that's kind of a turnoff for me. I'm a little bummed by that. At least in the original Cascadia, we could hate draft, right? Or we could race for objectives. Well, you're in luck, folks. Because I didn't show them because they're not part of the base game. But here's a deck of Summit Goals. Uh, I believe these will be available as a, a separate promo after the game get, it comes in retail and you can get it at conventions or stuff like that. But it is available right now if you're backing the game while it's crowdfunding. Uh, what you do is, as part of setup, you draw three of these randomly and these become public objectives that everybody is either racing to be the first to complete, like um, you'll be the first to fully complete any habitat, or, um, you know, or, or, or either you're trying to be the first to do a thing to get some bonus points, or at the end of the game, whoever did the best of a given act will score points as well. Like this one, whoever has the fewest leftovers, whoever used the most of their stuff and didn't stockpile things, will get to automatically fill in two final spaces for free at the end of the game, and that could cause a huge combo explosion all over the place. And so, these suddenly make the game not directly interactive. You're never messing with anybody. You're never stealing from anybody. But believe me, uh, the race to complete these things or the competition to be the best at these things really makes you hugely invested in what your opponents are doing. So those summit goals, I think for some people, are almost like, a, okay, they're mandatory. I need this so the game can become interactive at some level where I can care what other players are doing. And so those are available. And again, you can check the crowdfunding fan page campaign page, folks. You can hit that eye in the top right corner screen or follow links down in the show notes to learn more about those summit goals. I didn't demonstrate them, neither did Amy and Maggie, because they're not part of the base game. They're effectively a mini expansion. The base game is great without them, but 
if you want a more interactive version of the base game, you'll want to get those summit goals. And I think that's just about everything I've got to say, folks, for Cascadia, Rolling Hills, and uh, Rolling Rivers. And if, again, if you'd like to know more, you can go check out Amy and Maggie's videos if you haven't already, or you can uh, check out the crowdfunding page. Either way, have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, uh, bye.